you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, we are, uh, for our guests, going line by line, verse by verse, uh, through the book of Revelation. Uh, after this sermon, we will be officially halfway through uh, with the book of Revelation, which is really hard to believe, uh, but I uh, hope you have enjoyed hearing it as much as I have enjoyed preparing it and learning from it. Folks, every time we open the Word of God, we can learn something, okay? Even familiar texts, uh, you speak to us through these texts, uh, and uh, we just thank, the, thank God that He does that. Today, I want to talk to you about two witnesses. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, two witnesses. In the outline, <clears throat> the temple measured. The temple measured. Number two, the two witnesses. Uh, there is some controversy on who the witnesses are, but I believe the Word of God speaks directly to that. And uh, again, I will give you my opinion, but there are others. Number three, the witnesses killed. All right? Listen, folks, anybody doing something for God, making a difference, I am telling you, uh, Satan hates that person. And they will take, uh, they would, you know, even the, with, when Job, you know, Job, uh, you know, was a good man and Satan just says, you know, I, I want to take him out. And God says, you can do anything you want, but you can't take his life. And here's what the deal is, folks. We are under the divine protection of God. We're not going to go a day early. We're not going to go a day late. Everyone has an appointment with death. Number four, the witnesses resurrected. <laughs> Don't you like resurrections? <laughs> Man, I tell you, Jesus was resurrected and it gave us much victory in our spiritual life. You know, throughout history, God has faithfully sent his spokes, uh, pers spokesman uh, to call sinners to repentance. Old and New Testament preachers shared the gospel and Jesus himself preached the truth of salvation to many. During mankind's darkest hours, God will raise up two powerful preachers that will be fearless and anointed. They will proclaim God's judgment uh, on the wicked, lost world, and be totally protected by God. Their message will bring salvation to much of Israel. Let's look at these incredible verses in God's holy word. And by the way, a uh, few of the Old Testament prophets we are familiar with and uh, we will turn to these texts off and on through the book of Revelation are Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Some of the New Testament uh, preachers were P Peter, uh, the Apostle Paul, Mark, John the Baptist, Timothy, Titus, and even Stevens. And uh, tribulation evangelists will include the 144,000 Jews, the angels flying in mid-heaven, and the testimonies of other converted believers. Remember where we are chron chronologically. We are still in an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet judgments. So let's see the temple measure. Revelation 11.1, 1, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And it's kind of a strange thing, John, in his vision is an active participant in this. And the closest thing I can think about in this would be a yardstick. Okay, a yardstick. And, you know, when you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, there had been uh, several temples already built, and we know there are going to be two more temples built uh, through uh, the tri uh, tribulation period. And so I don't think the measuring stick was for specific measurements. I was, I believe it was symbolic for an evaluation, okay? Seeing if folks measured up. And the angel stood and said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and all those who worship there. And God gave uh, Moses and Aaron the specific instructions. I mean, foot by foot. And so there's really no reason in this particular part, you know, to, to do it all again and 
and focus on the measurements of these things. He is talking about how they measure up uh, in the temple of God. And we know, uh, as we can look at the book of Revelation, that the Antichrist, after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist is coming in, and he is going to uh, make a pact with Israel, and he's going to uh, promise them they can rebuild that temple. All right? That's the fourth temple. And by the way, there's five temples I want to mention in the Bible. First one we know is Solomon's temple. And David could not build that temple because he had too much blood on his hands. Zerubbabel's temple was the second one. Herod's temple was the third one. And the one we are talking about today, I believe this is the reference to what John is saying, uh, will be built, rebuilt in Jerusalem in the first half of the tribulation period. And you have to understand, uh, things have to go on because where uh, the temple was, the Dome of the Rock, which is uh, Muslims under Muslim control, is where that is. Uh, but we know God can do anything that he needs to do. And I believe in the vision, this is the one uh, that John saw. So we see the measure of the temple of God. We see the altar, and we know the altar of incense. We know the altars. We had covered that earlier in those who worship there. Uh, folks, there was a separation of Jew and Gentiles back in the Old Testament. We know when Jesus, uh, you know, arose, uh, the the, you know, the temple, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And that was the separation part of what the holy place is. It's where the Jews worshiped and the holy of holies where only the high priest could go in. And outside was the Gentile courts. And this is not saying now that there is a separation in this time and in this place. It's simply saying that from here on, even the day that we, which we live in now, we are living in the times of the Gentiles. You think of all those uh, kings over in the Middle East and all that is going over there, they are Gentiles. And they are going to go totally against the Word of God and people of God and preachers of God. The Antichrist coming on the scene, I, like I said, he's going to make a pact, but halfway through, the tribulation, folks. He will turn. He will desecrate the temple. All right. He will set up uh, worship of him. He'll make an image of himself. And uh, we see that in the Old Testament, uh, you know, that, that we've seen before uh, during Daniel's times and, and things like that. So what I believe he is saying is that people will be saved during that time, but it would be a limited amount. The Gentiles are in control, and again, there's going to be much persecution, and they will go after the Israelites and the children of God. And those who worship there, the altar, and then it says, but leave out the, uh, the court, which is on the outside of the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And folks, uh, even in this time, uh, there are specific things that will be going on that parallel with the Old Testament and what is going on there. One of the Old Testament prophecies are in Zechariah. Hold your finger there and go to Zechariah. Zechariah. I know I marked it. There it is. Zechariah 2, verse 1. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand so I said, where are you going? He said to me, measure Jerusalem to see what its width and what its length. And there was an angel talking with me, going out, and another angel was coming in and out to meet him, who said to him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and the livestock in it. For I say, the Lord, it will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. And again, he is talking about protecting Israel. God has always protected Israel. 
And I'm telling the, uh, the United States, better make sure whoever in, is in charge follows and protects Israel also. Because if you don't, folks, I'm just telling you, it, it's not going to be a pretty scene for the United States of America if we don't stand with Israel. And I pray that we will always do that. So we see the temple measured. Number two, we see the two witnesses. The two witnesses. Look at verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And here, what he's talking about as far as power, he's talking about Holy Spirit power and Holy Spirit pr protection. Protection. And they will prophesy. And we see here three and a half years. And notice how they start prophesying or their attire. It's in sackcloth. And we know in Old Testament times, a sackcloth was uh, goat skin. Normally it was black. And uh, it was an irritating to wear. And when you saw somebody in sackcloth, it was a time of mourning. Okay? And I believe these two, two witnesses were coming at a time where God, again, is speaking to the Gentiles and the Jews and saying there's not much time left. I also believe the witnesses were mourning over the sins of the people of the, that day. Folks, God hates sin. God hates us sinning. And so these witnesses were mourning and were showing outward signs of mourning, which uh, we as Christians should mourn over our sin. And then verse 4, and these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And we know that olive trees were you know, big around Jerusalem. We know the olive oil. Matter of fact, I keep a deal of olive oil in my office, in my truck, and at my home. Because I never know when someone will call me up and ask me, will you anoint my body with oil? And folks, it's in the Word of God. James chapter 5. But it is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So these two witnesses are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it will be an endless supply. You have to understand they're going to be preaching three and a half years. All right? All this is going on. There will be conversions, but there will be persecution also. And it says two lamp stand, stands. And we know that uh, lamps give out light. So they're under the power of the Holy Spirit, and they are God's shining light to these darkest times. Folks, you think we live in a bad time? When this happens, we're just, we're just halfway through the tribulation. I'm telling you, it will get awful from here out. I mean, things that you have trouble even comprehending, comprehending in your head will happen. So they will be the light of God and the power of God. And if anyone wants to harm, th harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. So God has made these special people. God is using these special men, and they are under the divine protection of God. And they're not dragons, folks. It's simply saying if people get to messing with them and try to kill them, they can literally spew out fire and protect themselves. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of the prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn, to them, turn of them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. My personal opinion is the ones here is Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. Other popular choices, Enoch has been mentioned, Joshua, Elisha, John the Baptist is a popular one, John and uh, Paul and Peter are a couple of pairs that some people say, and James and John 
But when you look at verse 6, it tells me everything I need to know about who these two witnesses are. They have the power to shut heaven. What did Elijah do? He predicted a drought. He just told the king, it ain't going to happen. And guess what? It didn't happen. What else? Rain falls on the prophecy, and they have power to uh, uh, power over waters to turn them to blood. Again, who did that? Folks, it was Moses. Okay, the plagues that they are talking about. And even fire raining down from heaven was Elijah. Even in the water, you know, before he did that and built the altar back up, he poured water in there, okay, to show the power of God. So when you look at verse 6, I think it really, really is plain on who these two people are. And if that's not enough for you, turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And if you can't see it after this, then I'm not going to finish that sentence. <laughs> Mark chapter 9, verse 2. And we know this is the transfiguration. And after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart from them by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Okay? Changed. Transformation. All right? Even in salvation, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. His clothes become like shining, exceedingly white. Like snow, such as no launder on earth can whiten them. It's saying you can take the Clorox and you can take the bleach. You can take any kind of material and try to make it shiny. It will not hold up. To the, the, the shininess of, of what he has on. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And you know, Peter is all gung-ho, but you know, a lot of times... You know, Peter just engages his mouth and doesn't really think things through, all right? And I'm not being hard on him. I'm just saying you'll understand this in just a second. Because he did, know, did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. Folks, only Jesus can be worshipped. Moses and Elijah was not to be worshipped. God just had this specific thing happen, this transfiguration to happen for a specific purpose and for a specific reason. So I believe the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Now let's look at point number three. The witnesses were killed. And folks, I don't understand how somebody can read the Word of God and say it's boring. I, I, I really, I've heard some people say that, and it just, it baffles me there. Look at verse 7. The witnesses killed, and when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends, ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And you said, well, I thought, you know, they weren't going to be killed. No, they were under the divine protection of God. God said they've been preaching long enough. All right, it's time for them to go. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. Now, folks, in those days, and even in the, our days, for people not to bury the bodies. That tells you how hated these two men were. That tells you how they desecrated, uh, you know, a, a corpse or a body. Matter of fact, most of the time in these days, the day the person died, they were buried. And then they'd have their funerals and things either late that day or another day. So this is the Antichrist way of saying, you know, we've heard enough of these two guys. 
They don't have the power. We don't respect them. And we're going to show you that by leaving them laying dead in the streets of Jerusalem. And notice he called it Sodom. We all know what that's all about. Uh, Sodomites, uh, you know, uh, sin, homosexuality, a God leveled Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, Egypt represents the world, idols, and many, many other things. And here, here's what breaks my heart to realize that that will be going on during these days. That these things will be going on, these atrocities, these things that would have never been associated with Jerusalem will be going on. Then it says, verse 9, then those from the people, tribes, tongues, and nations, notice they're covering everybody. So you could literally say the whole world looking on. Because I got news for you folks. CNN's going to be there. Fox News is going to be there. They're all going to be there when they see this happening. When they start breathing fire out of their mouths, they're going to have somebody staged there. And when they're killed, they're going to do it around the clock 24-7. And nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to another uh, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Can you imagine people having a party, people probably getting drunk, and all these things going on because these two witnesses were killed in the streets of Jerusalem. Zechariah 4 here. Go with me to Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4, verse 1. Now the angel who talked with me came back and awakened me as a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So he said, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on a stand, seven lamps with seven pipes through the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other to the left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked to me answered and said to me, Do you not know uh, what these are? And he said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word uh, of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now look at verse 14. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Folks, I am telling you, they were anointed of God. They were sent as messengers. They were preaching the gospel. They were telling folks to repent. And I'm telling you, the Antichrist uh, just got tired of it and he killed them in the streets. And the fourth thing, the witnesses resurrected. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Folks, I'm telling you, you can go back to Genesis. When God created mankind, what did it say? He breathed the breath of life into them. If you woke up today, you are under the divine blessing of God. He is life. He is ever breath that we take. And God has the power listen to me, to heal anyone. He is God. He can breathe life back into people. And they stood on their feet in great fear fell. So they got the attention of many, many people around them. Many. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. Well, folks, I believe with all my heart that was God Himself 
God Himself saying, Hey boys, your work is done. Come on up here. Come on up here. And, and they went up. Look at Acts chapter 1 with me if you would. I want to give you a familiar text as Jesus was leaving this earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. And when He spoke in these things, while they watched, He was taken up and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand, uh, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up uh, from you into heaven will so come in like manners as you saw him go into heaven. Folks, I'm telling you, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe the, the ascension which took place here. And folks, I believe with all my heart, Jesus is coming again to get his bride, the church. So you can take it to the bank, folks. It is going to happen. It is going to happen. And then the rest of our text there. And it says, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Why? Because of their actions. Because of the pagans. Because they desecrated these Bible, the, these, uh, Bible creatures, these witnesses. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Isn't it awesome that even in turmoil, even in the most trying times of life, salvation comes to the lost. So you know what it tells me? It's never too late to be saved. You're never so far away from God that you can't be saved. God is wanting you to be saved. Matter of fact, he says today is the day of salvation. Today for some. And it said they were afraid and gave glory to God. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. Go with me if you would. And we know the story here. There was folks trying to figure out who Jesus was. And, you know, some said he was John the Baptist. Some said he was Elijah. Others, Jeremiah and the prophets. But he personalized it in verse 15. But who do you say I am? Folks, do you understand that this is the most important question you need to answer in life? Not historically who Jesus is. We know He lived. We have proof that He lived 33 years. We have proof that He lived and, and He died on a cross and that He arose. Over 500 people, the book of 1 Corinthians 15 says, saw Him post-resurrection. So we know He's alive. My question is, who is Jesus to you? Not your mama, not your daddy, not a brother or sister, not to some preacher that you loved. Who is Jesus to you? You better have an answer for that, folks. Because that's what salvation is. And Simon Peter answered and said, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Folks, we live a God that's alive. We live for, we we have a God that is alive. It's not a statue on a mantle. It's not some kind of symbolic thing, you know, that we put in a church. It is God, Jehovah, God of this Bible. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And here's the verse I wanted to get to. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, Okay, he's talking about the rock, Jesus. Jesus, I will build my church and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against it. Folks, Satan hates what's going on at Rye Hill Baptist Church. And we are going to be, I wish I could say we're going to clear out sometime and just have smooth sailing. But I'm telling you, Satan will keep attacking us and keep attacking us and keep attacking us. But do you know what my Bible says? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He will not win. Satan will not win. He is a defeated foe. And so, just as these two witnesses were killed, God used that for His glory, and many people came to salvation because of that act. Church, do not fear. Do not fear. God is here. God is with us. God is in us. God is beside us. His angels hover over us. And the gates of hell will not prevail if we will stay close to God. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I just thank you for texts like these. And uh, God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us and God, we just we need you now more than ever. God, we need you in our lives. We need you in our church. We need you in our families. God, this world has gone crazy. And Lord, we just need to stay close to you. We need to stay close together in fellowship with one another. We need to read our Bible more. We need to pray more. We need to love you more. It's going to get tough. It's going to get tough. But God, I thank you that you are all powerful. You are more powerful. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. So God, we give you this invitation. And God, first and foremost, if there's someone here that is not going to make it in the rapture, they're not going. They know they're not going. I pray that you would Help them understand salvation is near. God, I pray that they would just walk down the aisle and give their heart and their life to Jesus. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray that we would recognize spiritual warfare. It's my life every day of my life. And God, I'm telling you, I know you're there. I know you get me through these things. So God, we are going to trust you. God, I pray that we will depend on you for everything. God, we love you. We praise you. Maybe a Christian needs to rededicate their life, or maybe they need to move their church membership, or come for baptism. God, whatever needs to be done, I pray that your spirit would flow from this place. God, I pray that we would see revival in our church. God, I pray that we would just keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen.